Hi, uh, my name is Terence Joyce. I'm an artist. And uh, this is a piece that just came out of my studio here in Venice, Florida. Uh, I paint from many different inspirational modes, and I'm, I'm going to tell you all about this one. Uh, I've been painting for more than 60 years. I started when I was 15 years old in a monastery painting murals. Uh, I consider myself a very successful artist. Uh, by that, I don't mean I'm well known, I don't mean I'm wealthy. I, I do okay. Uh, but what I mean is I've been able all my life to express what I wanted to express in the arts. In painting, in writing, in dance. I dance mostly for myself. I sing. Uh, but I've been taught by many wonderful people. They shared their experience of how to find my voice and how to sing it out. How to express it in whatever way comes uh, my way that day, whatever I'm inspired to do that day that goes along with my aspirations of being the best human being I can be. And that's not always easy, but wonderful people taught so many things to me. And uh, I pass that on to my students and apprentices. Uh, they want to make their paintings. They want to make the best that they can do. And yet there's so many beliefs about what a good artist is and isn't. And so we go through that. And uh, so this painting um, uh, is very recent. It took me five years to do this because I wanted to make sure my voice was accurate, that I was painting what the painting was asking for, not just what me, the artist, was asking for. And sometimes there's a difference. There's a difference between my mind and my heart. And that's what this painting explores. And uh, it's a wonderful time to be an artist, and that's what I keep telling my students. It's never had so many opportunities in the arts. The music, to make videos, dance videos. Uh, you can write your own book and self-publish. You can put anything, a painting you just did, a sculpture, you can do an image of it, put it online, press send, and immediately you, you have a global audience. And this has just never happened before. And it's, it's amazing, and, and except there's also some little troubles in here. In this global culture we live in, kind of a babble of sights and sounds, some truthful, some not so truthful. Uh, it's, we may need more skills than some of the old skills for how to telling, how to discerning truth and beauty. And from my experience, which art is, all of the arts, explore truth and beauty in many ways, whether it's music or a painting or writing. It's all about exploring truth and beauty and bringing it out for other people, the audience. So uh, what, I, what I understand is that there's a thin line between the art, the artist, and the audience. They're always interrelating with each other. So uh, let me tell you about this one. This painting came out of an extremely mysterious manner. And I want to, I want to tell you all about that. Really very mysterious. Um, it was a vision. I was visited with a vision, a real, authentic, actual, mystical experience that asked me to do this, pretty much the way it is. The, 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 the sense of the painting is the sense of that vision. And uh, it was a commission. I was commissioned by, I believe, the universe. I feel like it's the universal uh, intelligence that humanity is part of. Um, to tell the story of how humanity is influenced by the arts and how, as I was led to believe and very much understand, artists are often the most neurotic, uh, the people most thought of as low, and what do they know? And yet the artists are the ones that are continuously, since we came out of the caves, asked to bring forth new truth, to show us new beauties to live with and by. So uh, that's what this uh, painting explores, how that happens. What is that process? And I've come to believe that it's a cosmic and ecological intelligence, the cosmic being the heavens, God, the universe, creative force, us, in t uh, the ecological human made of flesh, canvases made of, of earth matter, brush and paint. Is a, and that relationship between the two, I think of it as a mystical relationship. 
not just spiritual, maybe a little beyond spirit, uh, into the heart of spirit, the mystical. And that's what I've, I've been exploring in this, and I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, the, the vision, this wonderful, glorious, very mysterious, mystical time of my life, also asked me to do a book about my process of creating this. And that's where I got into the thing. I wasn't sure if I was creating the painting or the painting was creating me. And it was a back and forth thing for five years. Uh, I'll, I explain it in the book. So it asked me to do a book about the process of making this and sharing that, as I'm doing right now. Sharing that process of from inspiration to manifestation to presentation of the piece. And that's what I've been doing for five years. Um, so this is a real, this came from a real live mystical experience. Scared the heck out of me. <laughs> you probably get scared when I talk like this. It scared me. I thought I'm losing my mind. What's going on here? Why am I, and I committed to this. I wanted to do this. I wanted to explore what, what my inners were telling me, what my inspiration was telling me, what my heart was telling me, and what my mind was telling me. And if they all had gone bad, uh, I thought I was delusional. I, I thought I was losing my mind at moments. Uh, I've had many mystical experiences, and we'll talk about that. So I, but I went to friends with this, because I was going to commit to this, and it was a big project. I knew I would have to be the most truthful I ever was, and find the most beauty I ever could find. So I talked to a lot of friends. I said, am I crazy? Uh, I talked to a lot of religious people, a couple of priests and ministers. And I said, what a, is there a manual? Is there a book for what you do when you believe you've had a mystical experience that asks for an actual presentation of something, an actual effort, an actual action? And uh, I got a lot of variety of responses. Uh, my friend said, don't worry about it, you know, if you're mystical. And I thought, I'm not a mystic. Mystics are saints and pros prophets and people like that. I'm not. I mean, if you know me, you'll get to know me a little bit. I'm not a saint. I'm not a prophet. I'm an artist. But they reminded me that many artists throughout history have had the works come out of mystical experience. William Blake, uh, Yeats, Alex Ginsberg. Uh, Whole cultures, the uh, Kabbalah culture comes out of mystical experiences, their art and their music. Uh, Sufi culture, indigenous people all over the world, their culture comes out of the mystical moments that the shaman brings forth, their artist brings forth, and then the culture lives by it for a while until it needs changing again. So, this, uh, so that, that was settling for me, <laughs> that okay, I'm not wacky. I even went to a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist, uh, with the army and deals mostly with PTSD, and I'll talk more about that, but I said, is this coming, is this, am I making this up to compensate for so many um, for severe PTSD and other uh, things that happened to me that were troublesome? He said, no, no, this seems to be something weird, he said, it's just weird, <laughs> mystical. So I went ahead with the project and I've been working on it uh, and as I said, I came to believe that the whole process of the arts, all of it, is some sort of, mis there's a mystical element within the arts. It may not have been tapped as much as it, in that manner, called that way, mystical element. I actually have been working with some scientists, and they understand that. Uh, it's not like a kidney or a, a liver or anything, but some combination of elements within the artist and the art appreciator. Art is almost dead if there's not somebody absorbing it, appreciating it. So this painting is about the artist, but also about the audience. How the artists, by exercising their practiced craft, form an energy that illumines the audience. So the title of this painting is Illumination, Divine Guidance of Humanity Through the Arts. And the book that came out of it is a title the arts as a spiritual practice, or how to make art in this culture without losing your soul. And the book came, of course, from so many of my experiences and the things that so many people gave me over the years that I'll talk more about in a minute. But uh, the biggest question I was asking is, how am I making this? Where is this coming from? Where are the various figures? Where are the elements? Where is the design? Where is the color? 
where's the, all this coming from? In me, obviously. So the exploration of this was amazing. And the book comes out of that. Uh, one of the artists, uh, besides William Blake and so many other people, Huxley, who have gone into their own mystical experience, was Carl Jung, somebody I admired a lot. And I didn't know until ha I was halfway through here, somebody gave me his red book. Now, this is a book that Carl Jung had mystical experiences when he was in his 30s. And he decided to delve into them, analyze them, document them. And he said all his life that all of his psychological foundings came out of that time. But he didn't publish the book. He didn't want to publish because he thought he'd be thought of as crazy. And he needed his reputation to bring out his other very helpful suggestions to the field of psychology. Uh, but he went in and he thought he was going crazy, except that he was a psychiatrist. He had the advantage of realizing this is probably something that happens to some people. Not everybody, but some people. And what's the meaning? What's the purpose? And he was a painter too. He was a writer. Uh, his art is beautiful. And he did art from these mystical experiences. And uh, he's one of my heroes because he said something. And he was asked once, are all artists neurotic? which is a big part of this. Uh, if the universe, if God is trying to send a message to the world about what, not, not serious messages, they're all in entertainment and beauty, uh, but it's constant message, constant updating on illumination of what each era should do that's different than that before. You can't do what was done. It wouldn't be new. And it has to come from mystery because what was what is here now is. And the artists bring forth what wasn't yet, what's unknowable yet. They go into mystery and they bring it out as new, next, now. Whatever that is, whatever their craft is, the artists, the dancers, the poets, it's, it's always new. And Carl Jung was asked, well, are they all neurotic? And he said yes and no. He said, when a poet is writing her poem, she fusses over every little word, erasing it, until she gets it perfect. And when the audit, you know, he's putting just the right yellow next to that green, and this red, this, this, oh, I love the way that red goes with that green over there, and this black. And while an artist is in the creative mode, Carl Jung says, they're more than 100% out of ego. And I find that astounding, more than 100% out of ego. Into heaven, into spirit, somewhere else other than ego. And what a gift that is. And every artist knows this. And every creative person knows this, that while you're creating, sometimes you know, I'm just not here. Where am I? And then he says, and then you put your pencil down, clean your brushes, go out the door, and the world, this era, this culture, this global thing just seems so crazy and insane and troublesome that their reaction, after having been in spirit in heaven, they, 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 they bunch up and put funny clothes on and hide, and, and to other people that looks neurotic. Um, Auspensky, the Russian philosopher, uh, said that the divine, years ago, 100 years ago, he said, the divine speaks to humanity continuously through sacred books and other things, but mostly through the arts. And then other people have to interpret these arts, religions, the other parts of the culture, and, and then government is the next way the divine guides humanity. And government makes, makes raw rules and laws, and they go bad, and we have to do it all over again with the next painting, the next song, the next uh, movie that tells us what we're actually seeing and experiencing as a people. So it's a continuous thing. And uh, so this came out of mystical. And like I said, I, I was kind of upset and freaked, but not totally. Um, I've had more than three dozen mystical experiences since I was a kid. Never ever thought much about them, believe it or not. I just didn't think about it. It seemed normal to me. Uh, it seemed like what everybody else, and to a great extent, a lot of the people, 
that I've lived my life with seem like very sensitive in a lot of ways. Uh, and I just assumed they all had these moments. And like I said, I didn't think much about it, but it seems to be what guides my life from moment to moment, mystical experience to mystical experience. They've always been incredibly wonderful. Uh, my experience of anything other than material is total goodness that we bring into material. Always these, these three dozen experiences were about goodness, beauty, goodness, and I always finished them off. I, I would slowly come back to reality. While I was having the mystical experience, or while I was being engulfed in them, I was very aware of my surroundings. But at the same time, another plane of existence seemed where I was and what's possible. And something wonderful was added to me that I can't discuss because there's no thought that describes it. But always there was a sense of, I want to bring this back. I want to give this to other people. I want to contribute to my culture in whatever way I can. And uh, to my family, to my friends, to my culture. And uh, right from the beginning, though, as a, as a little kid, I lived in a wonderful, large Irish Catholic family in the New York City area. And it was just, they were charming and colorful, uh, but they were also very troubled. And some of the troubles wore off on me, as in a family that's, that's uh, very troubled. Uh, early sexual abuse, lots of religious abuse, psychological abuse of asking a child to do more than a child is capable of. I had ADHD. I developed PTSD as a child. I had obsessive compulsive disorders. All of the things. I reading dyslexia, and nobody, I nobody noticed it. I didn't notice it. It just seems very strange. And so, uh, but I was very fortunate. I've always been fortunate all my life. I've been just one of the most fortunate people I know. I was guided to a seminary when I was 13 years old in rural Ohio with a bunch of wonderful humanitarian uh, priests and nuns and a small class. There were eight kids in my class. And it was a time where I could develop dedication to those principles, to my aspirations. Yeah, I developed dedication, devotion to this world, to this world of goodness, and determination that I was going to say something no matter how hard it was. And I felt funny all the time with all those uh, alphabet soup of diseases going on within me as a little child. But, uh, but the kind, wonderful humanitarians. And in fact, that's where I started painting. The, one of the monks was doing murals on the, the chapel ceiling and walls and allowed me to help him. And boy, did that make my day, and I always say it made my career. I became a mural painter. And it was a wonderful guiding time for me, a very disturbed child. Uh, I came out of childhood disturbed, but that was some sort of a buffer, some sort of a development of spirit that probably saved me from some really severe damage. Uh, I went back to New York City, and it was the 1960s, and it, there was a turbulent tumultuous, very transformative culture going on there. And I lived in Lower Manhattan, Greenwich Village, and Soho. While Soho was developing as an artist community, it was very bohemian culture down there. And I became part of it. I was enmeshed in it. I dove in head first. I got involved in that. I bartended in, in clubs in Greenwich Village with famous writers and actors and, and all celebrity artists and, and non-celebrity. And the, the struggling and, and growing artists all talked about what their ideals, what they wanted to contribute. Uh, the successful artists were contributing, but they wanted to contribute more. And their frustration was that their producers or record companies uh, wouldn't let them do exactly what they want. But they were all talking about ideals. Very bohemian. They knew they were different than the rest of the people. And that's the, what came out of this for me, is artists are supposed to be different. That's what I teach my students. Honor your differences. Respect how different you are. Don't show them off. Don't try to exaggerate them. You don't have to. People know you're crazy as an artist. But honor that. And that bohemian culture, those people did. And I was within that. And it was a wonderful time. Unfortunately, the other side of that, uh, that time that made so many changes, the transformations 
that this autistic culture made, like the Woodstocks generation. Uh, lots of good stuff came out of it, lots of social changes. Uh, women's rights, blacks' rights, gay rights, rights of, uh, of grass to grow where it wanted in the state parks, all sorts of little laws. Some of them have diminished by now, but little laws to change culture. And it all came out of that artist's passion for their arts and allowing themselves to be who they were. So what also came out of that was the culture of sex and drugs and rock and roll. And I dove into that one too, just as I was in part of the culture. And a lot of people didn't make it out of that side of the culture. I almost did. Didn't. It, uh, it was a very fun time for a while, and then it was devastating. And I didn't know what was happening to me. But what was happening to me, all those neuroses that Carl Jung talks about that are sometimes within the artist, uh, all my early childhood broken parts broke worse, got worse. And I lived in despair for almost five years at one point that I would never find my voice again. I would never be able to express who I am how I see life, how I perceive reality. And I was, again, very fortunate. Some people came along who helped me understand that. Many, 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 so many people. And they're, they're part of all of this. They are in this. They are the energy for this. They are in my mind and in my heart. And they go into my canvas. So uh, I, I, I had to learn how uh, about my addictions. I didn't understand how crippling my addictions were that seemed like so much fun while I was experiencing them. Uh, but so many other things. Uh, there came a point where I, I remember going to the beach on dark nights in the quiet of a night with the sky, even in New York City at the beach, and just saying, whoever you are, whatever the universe, whoever you are that created me, this is what I've done with what you've given me. And I was filled with shame and remorse. I didn't think I'd done such a good job with all the things that so many people had given me. Uh, but I allowed people to help me. And by help, they didn't do anything for me. Nobody did anything. They allowed me the dignity of sharing their experience. And I could have the dignity of being able to take what I want and get up on my own two feet and live a life. And they reminded me that an artist is supposed to be an artist. They're supposed to be different. Again, honor those differences. They, they, I, I got so much out of that. And uh, to the point where a few years later, after I felt much better using all these principles that go into the book, uh, I remember going to the beach one night. Same kind of beach. Same dark sky with stars and moon. And that, that sense you get of quiet, just with the sky. And I heard myself say just the opposite. Look, what's, look what you have done with me. Look what the life has made of all that you gave me. All those people that gave me little pieces to stand up and become a human being that can contribute. And I was contributing by them. I met a wonderful, wonderful spiritual teacher, a saint. Uh, in India, he's considered a saint, a guru. His name is Sri Chinmoy. And he had a meditation practice at the United Nations. And that went right into my humanitarian needs to express. And he was an artist and a poet. He was an athlete. Uh, he was a philosopher. Uh, he wrote a lot. And he would teach his students, me being one of them, how to find the energies within the heart, the soul, the body, to express what you want to say. Say your word. We each have a word. We each want to contribute that word. And it's incredibly difficult. And so my book is, is, uh, is uh, so the chapters go along with three of the sentences that I remember him saying. Wherever you go, go with inspiration and aspiration. I had to find my aspirations, my true aspirations. Not just my goals and desires, those are good and I needed to know those, but my aspiration. And my aspiration was to express that goodness that I always saw everywhere, but to express it truthfully. 
And wherever you go, go with inspiration. So I had to make sure the inspirations that came into me, which come sometimes a dozen a day, I had to make sure the inspirations were in line with my aspiration, not somebody else's. I do commissions. I've made a good living as an artist doing commissions, things that other people want. But I still have to do that with my own integrity, my own sense of art, my own inspiration and aspiration. And he said, whatever you do, do with love and concern. I love making art. I just always have to this day. I'm going to be 76 this week. I love making art. And I teach my students to love that color. What, what are you doing? How do you feel about that color you're putting? And I want them to express how they feel about each color. Love it. Don't make it. And yes, it's a task. There's, there's lots of stuff an artist has to learn. That's the craft. That's a concern. Love and concern. I have to be concerned about my craft. I have to learn it. Nobody, nobody on this planet practices their craft as much as artists. Eight, ten hours a day is normal. We all know this. Actors, singers, dancers, the musicians have to practice their scales, their, their, their tones. The actors have to know how to be poised and at pause when they need to be. Uh, we need all of that stuff. Writers have to know when to put a, 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 an apostrophe in. Uh, I'm not good with that. But we, we practice, practice, practice for that one moment when we're presenting our work. And the energy that we put into that love and that passion we have for our arts, to the concern we put into making it perfect, as perfect as we can, somehow sparks light that illumines the audience. The man standing, standing in front of a picture in a gallery. The woman listening to an opera. Something transfers. I don't know how it does. It's, it's, I do know that it's very mysterious. It's undescribable. We can't fathom that. But it is accessible, the mystery. And the artist gets access to it and puts it into their work. And the audience then has access to that. And they need qualities too. The book is to audiences too. They need discernment. What is the divine saying to me in this? Like I said, it's not always serious, but there's something coming. You know that sense you get when you hear a song for the first time and it touches you. And it influences your day. And maybe you go out and have a better day. So I was taught wonderful things, including whomever you see, see what purity is beauty, and responsibilities glory. So I, I'm responsible for showing my work, presenting what was given to me as goodness. I'm responsible for giving that to the audience, to the art appreciator, in whatever way this artist can, through painting and, and, and writing. So uh, I'm responsible for that, and I have to make sure it's truth, purity. And that's why this was taking me so long. It took five years for this. Each little thing I had to think, is that really what the painting is asking for, this line here? Or is that what me? I'm an attention junkie. I love attention. I like to go from inspiration to applause. But on this one, I knew I had to ask, is this what the painting's asking? Or is this what I'm thinking? Oh, they're going to think that's a fabulous line there. That's part of me. I had to know that and still work with it. I can't dismiss this. I can laugh about it. So I have to be, I have to have purity and responsibility. So uh, with, with what everybody had given me, I, I opened my own mural business in New York City where I had other artists helping me, apprentices, and it was wonderful. And I brought a lot of beauty and I prospered financially uh, and otherwise as an artist I was prospering. And then I opened up a gallery in Eastern Long Island in this wonderful, charming, town of Greenport, right on the harbor, an old harbor, old fishing village. Now it's a boat, it's a uh, marina, and the, the farms are now mostly vineyards, but it was a wonderful experience. My gallery was right on the harbor, and I loved it. I had people coming in, up to 500 people a day, huge gallery. I was showing my work and lots of other works. It became a salon. People of all sorts, writers wrote their, uh, talked about their books, poets wrote the, read their writings. 
uh, musicians, we all gathered and would talk about the arts almost like when I was young. But it was different. Something had transformed in the culture. And it shocked me. It terrified me. It amazed me. Almost totally, the conversation, truthful conversation with artists relating to each other, was about money and fame and success as it's described in our culture. And all of those are wonderful. And I want some of it, I've had some of it, but that's all the artists were talking about. And it scared me because I didn't hear any of the sounds of ideals that I had heard when I was young. Coming out of the muse, there's nine muse up there. Coming out of the muse, the, the, the history and beauty and writing and art, uh, that wasn't in what I was hearing. Uh, and it scared me. And uh, when I was young in the Bohemian culture, of course people were stabbing each other in the back to get their commission and their client and stuff like that. But they always had some sense of, I'm going to make the best thing. I'm going to keep within the ideals that are within my heart. And that had gone out. And that scared me. And uh, I think that's why I'm writing this book and doing this painting, because I'm old enough to remember some of what the arts were like and can be like for the next generation, some of the skills uh, that, that, that were then and maybe needed more. Yes, there's a lot going on. Uh, artists of all sorts have schools. There's, like I said, there's work for artists all over. Their craft is perfection almost. They, they, a lot of people go to school. They're taught how to deal with money and, and, and to some extent how to manage the market, how to get involved in the market. And I talk about this in the book. I call it crossing borders. How to go from the sacred aspect of your studio to the marketplace, which isn't always friendly to artists who are very sensitive people. But they're taught a lot there, but there may be other things that they need to le learn. How to get in touch with them. The combination of heart and mind, the intellect and the feelings put together, that's kind of gone out, uh, I believe. And so the book offers uh, whoever wants to find their own best, deepest, creative self, their unique, authentic person, artist, skills that people have taught me, I'm passing on to them. So let me tell you about the painting itself. Um, in the skies, there's a, a flutter of angels and saints and bodhisattvas descending, innumerable. Uh, the central figure is made up of the, the flutter, the swarm of beings coming down to assist humanity in, in this painting. Um, and they're, they're ushered in on this side by divas, wisdom mothers. The painting is about wisdom, feminine wisdom mostly. Well, I'll again get into that. But we've gone for several decades, centuries, with male dominance, which is good. It's got us to where we are. But male Wisdom is mostly about acquisition, uh, anger, <laughs> accumulation of other people's stuff and nations. And uh, all good. I, I can't judge that. I'm part of it. But what, I think what we're missing and what we need now, maybe in the future, is more feminine wisdom, the more nurturing to ourselves and the people around us in this very global culture. We're going to be global. And the next generation is going to have to live with that. And maybe what we're handing them isn't that valuable globally when their marketplace is, is the world and they still have to bring out beauty, not just numbers of products. That's what I heard, that the arts had become a product. And yes, this is made of canvas from, from the earth and the paint is from pigment and, and, and the brushes are all from earth. Um, but I'm here to say that when I buy a CD, it's a physical thing, that's not the music, that's a product, but the music comes out of the heart of the musician, the writer, the soul speaking through its music. And I'm here to say the arts are spiritual, they're not a product, as our culture has kind of made them into. And they have to have that balance. Uh, so uh, the, the wisdom of this, uh, uh, led by uh, Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. She, uh, a Jewish lady who taught her son to say his word, um, how to express what his goals 
aspirations, all of that. Uh, she taught him, and, and in the Christian tradition, she's sometimes called Mary, Queen of Angels, Queen of Saints. So she's ushering in angels who are dropping, there's some glitter on there, they're dropping grace. They're gracing the audience as well as the performers, the artists of all kinds. And uh, behind her is Green Tara. She's the Buddhist uh, uh, deity, and she's holding up a blue lotus. And the lotus, of course, is the symbol of beauty can come out even from the slime. The lotus grows in mud, in slime, just like beauty can come out even from the neurotic, broken artists. Beauty can come out. So she's blessing the world with her blue blossoms. Behind her is Pele, the Polynesian goddess. And I've been in Hawaii, and I watched that red lava just pour out of the earth, go into the water, and expand the land for, for earth, for us to be nurtured on, to grow things on. And she's coming with her wisdom. Bridget of Ireland, uh, she's known for weaving together the, the Christian traditions brought by the Romans and her own uh, native Celtic traditions, women's wisdom of how to take care of your family, your culture, your children. She, she brings that all to And behind her is Kali, the Hindu goddess, and she's fierce. She has weapons of swords and, and, and spears, and, and she's very fierce looking. And she looks like she's cutting off heads. And what she's doing is cutting off wrong beliefs. How do you get rid of wrong beliefs? Through the divine. She put the wisdom to get rid of the wrong beliefs and acquire more positive beliefs. Behind her, there's lots of others coming down. And they're coming down over the carving of Saraswati, the Indian goddess of wisdom and the arts. And uh, they're coming down there. And on the other side, balancing that on the other side of this theater, is Hague Sophia, the Christian understanding of wisdom and arts. And she, of course, is a direct descendant of the nine muses of Greeks and Romans. Uh, so it's about female wisdom entering and meshing with the already male dominant wisdom that our whole culture, all over the planet, we live by male wisdom right now. And we're just bringing in, we're meshing. Male and female has to go together. So they're coming into this uh, amphitheater that's uh, kind of in the sense of a Greek amphitheater where the arts originated. Uh, the performing arts especially originated there. A poet would recite his, his uh, poem and a choral group, as depicted here, would respond to it. And it was this dichotomy of sounds and, and pauses, and, and, and that's, that's, that's where this is starting. And so it's an amphitheater, but it's also a cathedral. And uh, somehow it looks like a cathedral. And cathedrals were a place not only of liturgy and worship, they're a place of performing. Every major town in Europe had these big places where you would go when something wonderful was happening or something terrifying. When, when a prince was being uh, uh, getting his crown, or when the army from the next group of town was coming, they'd go there and they'd say, what are we going to do? And, and so there's a pageantry. The whole thing has a sense of pageantry of cathedrals and amphitheaters. And I think pageantry is an art form in itself. It's when humanity gets together, and whether it's a, a, a music festival, art festival, I love pageantry, parades, it's humanity exchanging, uh, not just by your own computer. You're out there with everybody else. So uh, they're coming down here, and uh, they're blessing everything. So there's camera crews and lighting crews. There's scenic artists here and scul uh, sculptors, builders. They're, the audience is being led in by showgirls uh, to their appointed place where they can best observe and take out. And also over here, there's a bunch of clowns warming up the audience. And I think they're reminded, I don't know any, I didn't plan any of this. All of this came by itself, but using my symbols and my history of technique and, and figures and stuff like that. But I think they're reminding us not to take any of it too serious. That five years from now, there'll be this stuff. A generation from now, they won't even know what we thought was so important. Uh, so they're warming up the audience all around. 
of the musicians. They're, they're dark and almost anonymous. And yet there's so many of the arts just depend on the practices, the, the performance of the musicians that's behind and almost not heard, not noticed sometimes, but they're there all the time. So there's a story going on here. Um, let me start over here. This is Romeo and Juliet. Young love. Everybody knows this story. Young love. There's nothing, nothing more precious in the entire universe than young love. It has potential, incredible potential, and joy and happiness and goodness about it. But as we know, this play, there uh, behind them is her nurse and Shakespeare and Dante, the writers, and Caleb de Green, the writers and poets who make all of this stuff that the performers of her. So they had that, uh, their families were against each other. And you're not going to marry my son, and you can't marry my daughter, you're not good enough, and, and all of that. And it ends tragically, as we all know. And this goes on and on. And what this painting and, and the arts really say is it's a continuous Humans are the same throughout the centuries. We, we think we're the only generation. Every generation seems to think that, but it's the same thing. And we need to tell these stories, these myths, uh, to remind ourselves of what other people have done, positive and negative. Uh, so after Romeo and Juliet, what's depicted here is many years later, and that story's been told in so many cultures, but here's West Side Story. Bernstein's uh, musical dance, movie about the same process. Young couple in love. They sing, there's a place for us. They're looking for a place where their love can develop and blossom. Maybe have children, create a community, which is how love spreads from person to person. But here we have the dancers on fire escapes uh, coming down. Uh, Men and women dancing, and they all kill each other, or the principals all get killed. And another, it's tragic again. So it's an ongoing thing of what sometimes we do as humans. Down here is a pivotal point in this painting. It's Tristan and Isolde. Isolde standing over the slaughtered body of her lover amidst this clutter of friends. They were all friends, and yet they were from different kingdoms, and they thought they had to kill each other. And the soprano in this opera is singing this Wagnerian finale that goes on, and yet you're not sure if she's singing about her tragedy. She's delusional with love, loss. She sees a whole different world, a world of spirit. She sees him, Tristan, and her up in the skies. And I don't know if it's a mystical moment, but Wagnerian's music was kind of mystical. Um, Many people have, have tried performing that, that finale, and it's a very difficult. Nietzsche said that it's the, when he heard that opera, that finale, he understood what the arts were for, communication. Mark Twain said when he heard it in Paris, he felt like a heathen in heaven. All his previous beliefs didn't add up to the beauty of what came out of this soprano's voice as she expressed this. So, so it's, it's a, a turning, turning point here. here. It's what, what can we do? Can, can we see things differently? differently? Art gives people a different perspective on life. All the arts, that's what we do. So, so here's uh, Hamilton, Hamilton behind them. And he, he has ideals. He has wonderful ideals. And, and he has ambitions. And the play is kind of about how his ambitions override his ideals to the point where his family hated him. He lost the love of his family. Uh, his enemies were the redcoats. So here, so there's another little thing going on here. It's a Christmas play. Uh, and uh, the, the little children here, child actors, their first part in the theater, uh, they're soldiers, redcoats, just like Hamilton's arch enemies were the redcoats. And that's kind of what we do. We bring in children, and we bring in these beautiful young beings, and we make them warriors to kill other young beings. And and that's just wrong. That does, that's not the feminine, that's the masculine. Maybe we can get some. And so in the center is like a new ideal. Uh, birth. 
divine incarnation of new light, new ideas, new ways of living. Uh, does it have to be like that? That's what that asks. So here's a departure from, from what was Romeo and Juliet all the way through here. It's uh, South Pacific. And the lieutenant's in, in love with this young Polynesian beauty. He meets this woman. He's on a Pacific island uh, as a, a lieutenant in the Navy. And he falls in love. But he sings the song, Rogers and Hammerstein's song, You Have to Be Taught to Hate. Maybe that's, that's what, what we, we do. do. We know that now. We do a lot of that. We teach children how to hate. So, so he, he wrestles with his demons, his soul, and he, but I love her, but I'm not supposed to. She has slanted eyes and dark skin, but I love her. And he wins love. He wins that battle that they couldn't. He's a new way of seeing things. He saw through that we have to be taught to hate until I can learn to love. So, so that's, that's what this is about, about. and he's supported by a cast. And the other, other song in that uh, South Pacific is Bali High. And here I have a, a whole pool of dance group. But, but it's, it's a poly the Polynesian principle in this. Uh, Bloody Mary is saying, Bali High, there's a place where any one of us can go. We all have that inside. We can go to that place, that island inside where we can be whatever we want to be. We don't have to be what we were taught to be. We can find a new place, a beautiful place. It's a, it's a lovely song. And uh, so how do you get there? That's sung by this um, uh, Bajan group. Uh, they're singing old Sanskrit songs on how to get to that place inside. How do you get there? And again, the music and the song and the chants can bring you to that. It's all, it's all part of the art. Here's a, a young couple just exuberant with love. They love each other, they're dancing. Nothing more beautiful in the world than expressing their love to each other. Here's three male, three female vocalists, Chantreuses, and this uh, comedian is introducing them. And I imagine he's singing that song, Quiet Please, there's a woman on stage. My friend Peter Allen wrote that. Quiet, please. There's a woman on stage. So these are chantreuses, female vocalists. And they are going to sing their song, no matter what. And it's not always easy. And I, I worked in cabarets in Greenwich Village. And on those Friday and Saturday nights, it was rowdy. And people were liquor up and smoke. And they still have to sing their song. It's in their heart. And they use their feminine charms for that in whatever way they can. They have to quiet down that audience just for a moment. And I've seen that happen. Rowdy, rowdy bunch of people. The moment the vocalist opens her mouth, they shut up. They get paused by the beauty of her voice, her song, her word. She's saying her word. And somehow it's influencing them. And yes, I'll go back to throwing glasses around in a couple of minutes, but maybe the gotten something from her. And each one of them goes out there knowing that uh, most of the men in the audience are just looking at her with lust and the women are looking with envy and, and you know, judging her. But they still have to go out there and they use their feminine charms uh, in various ways, country, western, geisha. So that's part of the arts. So uh, as we go across here, here's the art of indigenous folk wisdom. Uh, a Native American is talking his story of the seven generations of how they live. It's, it's more wisdom. And they talk about the seven generation talks about before you do anything important that's going to affect your, your life and your culture, your tribe, get together and talk about it. Look back in history at the seven generations before us, how we got here. What they did, their, their, their positive stuff, their contribution to us, and their mistakes. Why we didn't do this when we decided to use the atomic bomb as a way of life, uh, I don't know. I don't know who made that decision. It's weird. Uh, an artist probably would not have. Uh, so they, they, after they decide what came to them, then they ask, how can we 
the decision I'm going to make now about whatever's going on in the culture now, how is this going to affect the next seven generations? My children, my children's children, my grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren. How is this going to affect that? I don't think we do that. I, don't th I think we've stopped thinking ahead to how my actions are going to have consequences. Our actions, our collective cultural actions, art speaks to culture. So we're, 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 we may have to rethink how we think about our actions for the next seven generations. Here's a poet writing about how beautiful that could be. Poets envision all sorts of things, all sorts of things. Poets are probably the most sensitive. Uh, they, and their poems sometimes go into country western songs, into operas, into all sorts of things. Here's a, a Sufi uh, dancing. He's centering himself in his body movement. The body itself can get beauty and intelligence and express it. And then they go out into his community and just bring beauty out there. So, so that's what a lot of these principles are. But then the question is asked, how do you get back up? Where do we come from? What are we doing here on, in life? And what happens afterwards? So here's, uh, here's the fawn from Dubusset's Afternoon of this Fawn. Now he's half goat and half man. And he's just that uh, he's trashing the scoff of the latest virgin that he, 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 uh, he divergent. Uh, and he's proud of himself, and yet he's tired of it. And he's asking, can I go to higher ground? Can I see life from a little higher perspective? And he looks up towards Harlequin, who has somehow got up this rope to a little higher perspective. But Harlequin, who's a, a character in so many movies and plays and musicals in, in Europe, he's looking down. Does he want to go back and live the animal life, or does he want to go up to where Perot is? Perot and Holokin are in so many pieces, art pieces in Europe, paintings, and, and Perot's sitting up there. He's a holy fool. He's a mime. He can't speak his word, but he can feel it. And he's gazing at the divine from some lofty place that he doesn't even know how he got there. But he's a holy fool. And the, the Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox have great regard for the holy fool. And to some extent, that's what artists are. The holy fool, they're passionate and devoted and dedicated to their craft, to their, to, to their, to their expression. And yet to most people, they look crazy. They, why are you doing that? You're not making money. Why are you practicing so much? You're not making money. So he's gazing up there. That's how he got up there. I don't know how he got up there. But there's another line of ascension here. It's uh, this from uh, the play and movie Jesus Christ Superstar. And Jesus is being suspended by a figure up there. I'm not sure if it's his father, uh, uh, Krishna, his older brother. Uh, but he's being suspended. And what's suspending from him is Mary Magdalene. And she's hanging on to those, aerial dancing, <laughs> a new mode and as well as an aerial dancer that's doing yoga, a Buddha, Buddhist aerial dancer descending from Buddhist wisdom, and she's combining both. Mary Magdalene seems to be the disciple who really understood what Christ was saying, and she's meshing it all, all of the wisdoms from Alexandria and, and Israel and Persia, and that whole time of, that she was with Christ, and she meshes it together and, and drops it down to the next character, this figure here. I'm not sure who he is exactly. This one I know. This is a friend of mine, or rather. She, she's an artist, and she does profane art. She blasts everybody. Her, her art is uh, against religions, against culture, against politics. She does these loud paintings proclaiming, do you really believe this? <laughs> That's what her art is. And we need that form of truth, too, in the arts. Sometimes arts go into what's disturbing us, and we still have to say something. It's not all beauty. Sometimes it's outrage, and art has always learned, been the one to express it first. This is me in a running outfit. I ran across the country a couple of times in this United Nations Run for Peace, the one this home peace run. And uh, while I was doing it, I sketched, and, and the first time I, I had my first one-man show. 
after doing that, but I was really happy about expressing the possibility of world peace. Possibility. And that's what the arts all talk about, possibility. So this whole guideline here is being held by my teacher, uh, Sri Chinmoy, he's holding that. And so the whole audience is getting something from all of these actors, using their energy, expanding their energy. So this paint, that's about what this painting's about. There's so much going on, but, but I don't really claim any responsibility. I painted it, and it came from my understandings of so many things, but it kind of painted itself. And that's what the book's all about, the, the relationship between the art piece and the artist. Who's creating who? I know I've been changed by doing this. And that all comes out in the book. And the, the painting is looking for a home. It's looking for a home in a school of, uh, the, school of the arts, in a performing arts center, in a, the lobby of a spiritual or religious community, because it's about spirit. It's about humanity and spirit. And I'm hoping somebody can purchase it, uh, a group, and bequest it to one of these places. It, 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 it wants a good home. And the book's coming out at the end of 2021, and it's going to be free to any artist who says he wants it or she wants it without any paperwork. Uh, if I get some people to, to buy that, I'm not a wealthy artist at this time, but so I'm hoping some people will come and help me give this book out when it's published to the people who need it. I'm Terrence Joyce, and it's probably going to say terrencejoycegallery.com. Thank you very much.